follow, I said I wouldn't do this again. I said I would do monthlies and I haven't, but I will still, I still refuse to give up on the dream. So today I'm going to be talking about every book I've read since I last made a video, which was on the 29th of May last year. Uh, apart from I'm not going to talk about rereads and that kind of thing, but still we have 33 books here to talk about. So let's get started. I need to start with an apology because I have lied already. The first two books are rereads, but they're special rereads. Um, and that is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. These are the illustrated editions by Jim Kay. These are just the most lovely books. Although they're, it's, it's not like overly heavily illustrated, but it's quite like their tones. So I just sat in my little reading chair in the corner um, with a cup of tea and just really enjoyed Harry Potter again from the start. Uh, there are only three of them out at the moment. I do also have Prince of Azkaban, but I haven't read it yet. I'm sort of saving it um, because I don't think Goblet of Fire is going to be out for a while. It's going to take ages until we get the whole set. But they're just so beautiful. They're really, when I bought this, the first one, I was like, this is the copy of Harry Potter I'm going to read to my children, which is just a wonderful thing to behold. First of the real books, we have Anything You Want by Derek Sivers. This was given to me uh, for my birthday by a friend. It's just like a man who had a really successful business and like is talking about what you should do. Um, I didn't like it too much. It was like, it's like just like a short inspirational flick through kind of thing. 40 lessons for a new kind of entrepreneur. The thing is like most of it was like, just go and do the thing, just go start it and you'll be successful. And it's like, you just happened upon, he started this business called CD Baby, which like made CDs, sell CDs uh, online from independent musicians. He just like happened upon the right idea at the right time and doesn't really acknowledge how much of a goddamn fluke that was and how that's not really, like, you can't just guarantee that your idea is gonna be that. So, you know, mixed feelings about this one. Then I listened to a couple of audiobooks. Firstly, James Acaster's classic scrapes. James Acaster, James Acaster's, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. James Acaster is a very dry, like sardonic comedian. Um, and he just has got him himself into these like really odd situations he tells the stories as a guest on a BBC One radio show. I don't remember who it was, this person. Uh, and eventually just decided to compile them into a book. And it's just, it's very funny and it's read by him and I liked it. Next I listened to Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. I'm a big Ryan Holiday fan. I could just inhale anything he writes. Um, and I did, it wasn't as good as Obstacles of the Way for me. It's, it's more about like the person and the ego and I just like, I'm not as into that. But again, like lots of, kind of classical references and historical political references and stuff and yeah it's good. Next real book we have Happy by Darren Brown. I love Darren Brown. I've been a massive Darren Brown fan since I was like 14 and funnily enough I met him at he was doing an event for his new photography book uh, a couple months ago and, and me and my friend Anna went and he was doing like a signing afterwards and but we didn't bring any of our books because we just didn't like think it through like that um, but it was happening in the big foils on Tottenham Court Road. So we just like went down to the shop and like got their copies of Happy and then got him to sign them and then put them back in the shop. So I hope someone's bought them now and like enjoyed the fact that we got Darren to sign them for, for them. This came out in 2016 and I did start reading it then, I think as in on my Kindle, but I just lost steam with it. Um, anyway, I decided to pick it up again uh, and it was just fabulous. So this is about, uh, it's stoicism, but through the lens of happiness. So happiness through the lens of stoicism, however you want to. Um, it's quite chunky, but it's just full of wisdom and insight. But my favorite bit was the last, maybe quarter, was about death. Um, I've just gotten into thinking about death this year. I'm shooting this on New Year's Eve, so I'm gonna say this year to refer to 2018 and not 2019, even if this comes out in 2019, I'm sorry. He's talking about as a celebrity, sometimes it's people's like dying wish to meet him um, and how he meets this one woman who just doesn't seem to be uh, like as afflicted or afraid of death as everyone else that he kind of meets in these circumstances. Um, and she is a palliative care nurse and her son is a doctor. So they're very like medically grounded and he just has like, like talks to her a lot about you know, how she's got into that state of mind of being just like really at peace with, with dying. Um, and it's really fascinating. I also around the same time started listening to um, You, Me and the Big Sea, which is a BBC podcast by uh, three women who have or have had cancer. Um, and just thinking a lot more kind of like holistically and naturally about death as a process um, was fascinating. This provoked a lot of interesting thoughts. 
um, in that realm. Next, I read this little penguin thing um, called Hiroshima by John Hersey. So this was an essay published in the New York Times um, a year exactly um, from the, the bombing of Hiroshima. So this was kind of like the first that a lot of Americans got to hear about what actually happened on the ground there. The way this is told is that there are six characters, six ca I mean they're real people, um, six people that were kind of like in different areas of, of the disaster, um, but people that like did kind of come together and split apart. So all these stories are kind of interconnected, but they're told as like distinct parts. Um, and just like the scope of that kind of disaster. There were so many things that shocked me about this. And probably the biggest one was how everyone just kind of got on with it. You know, there was so much resilience of the, in the people because they had to, obviously. Like your house has fallen down, like everyone's dead. You just have to live, live with it. Um, but you sort of, when you think about these kind of disasters, you think about like the day after. And this goes into a lot of detail of, of the day after. and you know, people not, especially not having any idea what's happened. Like there's a lot of different ideas about what has, what caused, they didn't know it was a nuclear bomb. Um, but then you also see like the months later where people are trying to rebuild their lives and are sort of forgotten about. Um, really, yeah, really good, good book. Next I read Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. This was really highly touted when it came out. Was it like two years ago? It won the Arthur C. Clarke Award in 2015, three years ago, four years ago, well, whatever it is. Um, it is a sort of like post-apocalyptic science fiction thing. It's really fun. It's like, I love this kind of premise. The premise is that there's this virus that kills off like 99% of human population. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, unless you read a lot of science fiction like me, you'd be like, oh, interesting. But like really every, every, form of society breaks down you know even if you killed out a third of people everything would collapse um so this is it kind of flicks between the the start of this disaster people getting ill and i want to say 30 20 years 20 years down the line um and it follows this uh this one girl specifically but inside this traveling symphony so it's a it's like feels very old school like they're on wagons and they go around performing shakespeare but in this like arid landscape with very few people uh, and they come across um, these kind of like cult dooms not doomsday but like evangelistic cults on, on the way around it's yeah it was just like a really fun and interesting read enjoyed this a lot the next book I have is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight um, Phil Knight is the guy that started Nike as you may be able to tell from his big old swoosh um, and this talks about everything from the it, him going to college and starting to get interested in shoes to um, Nike's IPO and everyone becoming extremely rich. I'm now extremely aware that I did not write notes on any of these books before I started talking because when I read this I had so much to say about it and now I like can't form words. This was a remarkably humble read like it's I expected it to be quite douchey um, but and uh, there's obviously like a tiny bit because he's like super rich and well known now but um, mostly it's very very like down to earth about how they they started getting customers and how he started employing people and the kind of like human relations of, of those kind of things but also he was you know flying to Japan and meeting executives and then being backstabbed and you get just such an interesting look into the world of, um, of shoe making. The latter quarter where it started to take off wasn't as interesting to me because it suddenly just ballooned to a scope that was really hard to relate to the earlier parts of the story but that's you know that's just how it escalated um, but yeah a really interesting memoir I would recommend to anyone that is like entrepreneurial business minded um you don't have to care about shoes i promise the next book i read was the vegetarian by han kang han kong um this is a strong recommendation by a work friend it won the man booker prize in 2016 and it was translated by deborah smith this is a really like evocative novel um, it's yeah translated from the Korean and it's about a Korean woman who decides to not eat meat anymore and her her family and her, her parents and her sister mostly um, just think she's gone crazy they think she's had a, had a mental break, breakdown and they're trying to make her come back to life because apparently meat is really important to them um, but she comes across as like a really despondent character like she's very she doesn't really show her feelings does she even have feelings and also 
she has such erratic actions that I can understand from the point of view of like the people trying to help her that she um, you know needs help but yeah it's a really one of those like yeah a novel of sexuality and madness that deserves its great success says Ian McEwan well can't say better than Ian McEwan really enjoyed it and her other book Human Acts I got for Christmas so I will be reading that soon as well my next book is a reread it's Obstacles the Way by Ryan Holiday I just want to mention this because I finally got a real paper copy of it so I won't have to keep listening to it and also it's just nice to have a physicalization of the thing that you care a lot about and think a lot about I need to go through it again and like highlight bits but yeah it's very pretty as well isn't it I like the you know Grecian it's cute nextly nextly is that a word after that I listened to an audiobook called Total Competition Lessons in Strategy from Formula One. So this was written by Adam Parr and was mostly a conversation between Adam Parr, who is a Formula One journalist, kind of, and Ross Braun, who used to be, who's like a really big guy in Formula One, basically. This is part of Adam Parr's doing a PhD into um, psychology, I guess, sports psychology. And uh, it was really odd because it was, because most of the book was just like a, a narrative between the two of them. Um, but Adam Parr narrated himself, then someone else narrated Ross Braun, which was very confusing because I feel like Ross Braun's voice is very familiar to me and it was odd. Anyway, um, it wasn't that great because it was trying to, I like, I really love, I'm a big Formula One fan, I love the history of Formula One and um, it's just, it's so deep and rich and interconnected. He was trying to have a conversation about that, but also slip in all of these like random stoic quotes from like the ancients. It was quite odd. Next book is maybe my favourite out of all of them, and that is Wild by Cheryl Strayed. I actually read this on my Kindle and then I was like, I need a copy of this. I'm gonna want to reread it again because it just spoke to my soul. This came out in 2012 and was a huge phenomenon. Um, there was a movie made about it. Reese Witherspoon plays Cheryl Strayed, which is cool, I guess. I haven't seen it. Uh, I'd want to though. Um, but yeah, I decided to pick this up finally because Cheryl Strayed does this advice podcast called Dear Sugars with Andy, Andy Armand um, and it's just a really kind of like deep, empathetic, hardcore podcast where it doesn't feel like you're just like there for entertaining, it really feels like they're bestowing wisdom and that you're, they're like your parents, you know, they've just like been through more and know more and they know the right answers to things. So this was like Cheryl Strayed's A Journey From Lost To Found, so it's her, it's going from whatever she was to like being this wise woman that I now consider her. Um, it was really fantastic. So basically at 26 years old, uh, Cheryl's like mum had died, she'd gotten divorced, she'd gotten addicted to heroin, um, and she decided to like just re-evaluate everything in her life. Um, and to do that, she wanted to walk the Pacific Crest Trail. This also was in the 90s. I want to say it was 94. I'm really bad with fact checking on this video. I will just like pop the information on top of me. 93? Who knows? It was in the 90s. Um, so there wasn't easy like mobile communication or whatever. She was literally just like walking on this rough trail into the wilderness. Just so it's such a crazy, amazing, like life affirming idea. Um, and you know, I just, I love the her descriptions of how you know, she, she struggled, struggled to even pick up her pack on the first day. And by the end of it, you know, well, even way before the end of it, she could like, you know, her muscles are toned and she was tanned and she understood how to talk to people on the track. She wasn't this like random new girl that was just messing around anymore. Like she was one of them. She was like a long distance hiker, but she also had all this time to, you know, think through her, her life choices and, and what she wanted to do afterwards and just seemed like a really revelatory experience like it makes me want to do something like that a lot i've since i mean we're gonna get to it later but i've just suddenly decided that exercise is important to me um and uh this kind of thing really appeals just like stepping out of your life and just trying to see who see who you are as a human and not who you are in the contents context of you know the people and things around you um really phenomenal and just enjoyable to read she's a great storyteller i really really love this would really recommend it and i'm going to 100 percent read it again sometime soon next book we have is trouble with lichen by john Wyndham. um so this is about when does this take place sorry published in 1960 right so it's the 60s uh what happens is this really like precocious woman 
uh, Diana, she uh, and her sort of mad genius scientist patron um, both kind of simultaneously discover this lichen which can slow down aging so anywhere up to like five times just slows down aging uh, and the whole book is then basically being like the people can't have it because then every like so many things would break down like society government wouldn't let it be possible because then you know we'd overpopulate and like there would be all these issues with people wanting to like spend more time learning and stuff like that because they have this much longer um so it's more just like a large thought experiment there wasn't much meat in it it, it felt like it was like that was supposed to be the first third and then there was supposed to be like plot but it cannot be denied that it is a it is an interesting thought experiment next i listened to an audiobook again shocker uh, this was Lethal Light by Robert Galbraith the Fourth in the Cormoran Strike series. I always get so excited to read these that I just like listen to them non-stop for a day and there's so much in them that I just, I miss half of it and it's a shame. So I'm going to go back and listen to the entire Cormoran Strike series again just to kind of take it in. Uh, but you know, it was great. So it was great. <laughs> the next book I have is What I Talk About When I Talk About Running by Haruki Murakami. Oh, now I get to talk about running, yay. Um, so this is his only non-fiction, but it's like his only, you think of Murakami for his fiction, but this is a memoir written um, just about his, his running. You know, he runs, although he's like 16 something now, um, he runs like a full marathon a year usually and runs about an hour every day, which is crazy. Um, but it just talks about his kind of like relationship with running over the years and how he finds it like really meditative and it's gotten to a point of being so much a part of his routine that he can't function without it. Um, and before I, before I read this, I'd been thinking like, I wanna get into running. And, uh, and I kind of read this knowing it would spur me on a little bit. Not that I'm running an hour a day, um, but I think running's always been one of those things that's just like, I wanted to be a runner, but actually becoming a runner isn't as easy as that. Like I go on a run every like couple of months and be like so exhausted and horrible being like I'm not gonna do that again uh, but with this I was like every day every day is how it works you know you make it a routine and then you can't escape it so I decided for the month of October to run every day barring big hangovers and terrible weather bad weather was okay but terrible weather I couldn't do um and I did and now I like run all the time I don't run every day I run most days maybe half days and it feels so good to be like in touch with your with your body and also this like running and doing this taught me that I could actually kind of take up anything you know I could just decide to do something and do it and that has been a major theme for me in the last couple months of 2018 that we're going to talk about even more later you think that this is the end of the pile there's another 10 books there's another 10 books under there <laughs> all right next we have an absolutely remarkable thing by Hank Green this is my signed edition I read my unsigned edition because my unsigned one was from the UK and this one I had to have sent from the US. Where are you? There's Hank's signature. What a shock. Um, yeah, I've loved Hank Green for many years. Uh, always been a big fan of, of his and John's work. Um, and this was, this was cool. It was just, it was like a fun science fiction thing about this statue that sh kind of shows, like these things called cars, like these big statues that just show up all over the world at the same time and no one can understand what they're made from or how, what they're doing here. Uh, and we're, our, our main girl, April, is like, just kind of like a citizen journalist that then ends up becoming really famous because she's the only, the person that has had first contact with these things um, and has a sort of like relationship with them. And then it's this fun romp of adventure of them solving these clues and riddles that the cars leave and blah blah blah. Um, not like a massive fan of the ending. I know there's gonna be a sequel. He's writing a sequel and I don't understand it. So this is like ostensibly about fame and about how people's reactions to being on, um, you know, cast into this light that, that people expect things from them. And I did find it interesting the way April kind of cultivated her own identity and like wanted to, wanted to be this, this like figurehead of this situation um without really thinking through what that would mean for her as an as an individual like she sort of divests herself of, of her personhood um through doing this 
And I think it would be interesting to see how that kind of comes out if there is a sequel, like what that what that becomes. Um, it was a book that was I felt I feel like it was trying to do too many things, but I still did really enjoy it. I I did really enjoy it. And yeah, good job, Hank. Debut novel. Next we have a book called A Buzz in the Meadow by Dave Goulson. Um, I picked this up in Dublin. You know, we just see something pretty and you're like, I need to see what that's about. Um, and it's just about this, this man who's a biologist, um, biology professor, and he bought a plot of land, uh, like an old farmhouse in, in France, uh, landed up, where was it? Heart of rural France, that's not a place. Um, he wanted to make a nature sanctuary and just cultivate um, a lot of like the wildlife that um, that sh should and could could be there. So he there's a lot of just like individual chapters about specific bugs and stuff and like butterflies and bumblebees and like pesticides. Um, and I really like this was just so enchanting. It was not like I'm this this book's target audience, but it was really interesting just being like i i'm so disconnected from nature i live in a city and i'm and through this it made me realize how everyone i'm surrounded with is so disconnected from nature not just like being out and you know i like to go on walks in the countryside but i'm still going on walks and like really kind of cultivated paths and and fields that are agricultural and forests that are you know different wildlife habitat habitats are kept at bay and this is a swan song for all of the species that die out through our over cultivation of land through uh, like just so many it made me wish that we had some of our like technology from now but just lived like 400 years ago and had a, like a lot deeper respect and connection with with the the natural things around us um really yeah i really like this and i'd love to read more of this kind of thing but it'd not be I don't want I don't want like a reference book about biology. I think it's good to learn more about um, nature and the environment. Uh, so if you have any more recommendations along along these lines, I'd really appreciate it. I need to get an allotment is what needs to happen because I keep thinking I need to move out. I want to be out of London. I want to be in nature and I want to have a dog. Um, but maybe I just need an allotment. Maybe that'd be a good start. I've always thought that I would love to garden. I I'll, I'd love doing gardening as a like retirement project. Um, picturing myself in like 40 years time gardening a lot but why don't I garden a lot now you know allotment it's allotment time Whew. after that we take a sharp left turn to an audiobook called Metro 2033 by Dmitry Gulgowski this has a cool premise so the whole world has gone to shit like nuclear something something and this is about communities that live inside of the um, Moscow underground which is just a very cool, it's very cool like as a concept anywhere, but just like in Moscow makes it extra cool. I've got lost on the Moscow underground before. And let me tell you, it's no picnic. <laughs> um, this follows a boy that's kind of tasked from getting something from somewhere else, but um, the in-between bits between, like most people live in the stations and there are some stations that are quite prosperous and some that are not. And the, the tunnels between the stations are quite like dangerous, but you also, you know, you get, uh, traders and stuff that use them freely but most people are kind of clustered in these in these stations um, I really like the premise it was a bit uh, like male oriented there was something that was it just felt quite yeah iffy icky about it to me um, but it was interesting to read I know it's like a four book series and I didn't care enough about it to do that so sorry but it was interesting why I'm six stories up and you can still hear this shit. Uh, okay, it's gone. The next book I have is a tiny little thing called Takeaway by Tommy Hazard. So this is, uh, I picked this up in, it was a recommendation in one of my local bookshops, Burley Fisher um, in Haggerston. And uh, he, it's, it's, it's so little. It was like a small publishing house called Morbid Books. Um, and this is, it's just 85 pages. I read it in the bath in one sit um, of a ambulance driver in Hackney. Um, so this is the, if you hear sirens on this road, it fucking well could be him because I'm on a road that connects two major hospitals in, in London. Um, and one of them is the 
hospital that this guy works at. So it's so like visceral and goes it goes from just talking about like really annoying people that call up the ambulance service like once a day to talking about like finding uh, young people that hung themselves. You know, there's such like a range of experience. Um, and it's also done with like a lot of humor, you know, because <laughs> this is anonymous, obviously. Um, it has, it's kind of odd that he's, he's saying sometimes they're just bad, you know, they're like lie about, because you're in pairs. Um, driving an ambulance they would just lie about being on jobs and like try and stretch out their brakes or like one time they like they f they fucked with the GPS system for call outs and it broke the whole ambulance service for half a day which is crazy I guess once if you're around this much morbidity and j like it's if it's so tangible you have to for your own sanity kind of like separate yourself from it mattering as much you know they see like people die all of the time um, but yeah, this is a really interesting insight into it. See, this is them. That's the, that's, the, that's could be Tommy Hazard. This is such an interesting insight into something that I wouldn't have thought about caring about otherwise. Um, it's very like visceral. Some of it is like quite disgusting, but very cool. Yeah, would recommend. Next book I have is All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Durr. This won the Pulitzer in 2015, uh, very highly renowned. It takes place in the Second World War. Um, and it is about uh, a small blind French girl called Marie Law and her, her father as they escape Paris um, during the invasion and a boy called Werner who, Werner who lives in, in Germany and is sent to like a school and then you know forced to, to join the, um, the bad side. This flicks between the start of the war um, and things kind of heating up in both of their lives to um, them being in the same place. Uh, I think it's after Armistice? Again, my fact checking, super shit. So we start in 1934 um, and then we flick to August 1944 at the end. Um, so it's just like really good. <laughs> it's, a good it's a good book. I don't even, there's no point in me espousing about this book. Like, you know, it's a good book. It won the Pulitzer. Um, I didn't like really care about any of the characters, which is why I couldn't give this five stars. Obviously like really well written but I never like felt particularly for any of them. Um, but yeah, it was a good, good book. I wonder how many times I've just been like, good, good book, eat it. Only 12 more to go kids. All right, next we have Written on the Body by Jeanette Winterson. Um, this was very like evocative and it's not, I feel like Jeanette Winterson's known for, for doing very like erotic fiction. And this wasn't, there was no like explicit eroticism in this at all. It is like a relationship between a woman and a woman um, and from from one side um, and I just I really loved it I really loved how sort of like sensual and like worshipful she is of this other woman's not just her body but just like her whole being it's so there's so much devotion and love which is a really just a gorgeous thing to see um, and to, to read the perspective from, although I didn't like her as a character, that that sort of emotion was 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 great. So I'm gonna read more Winston. Um, let me know. Should I read Oranges? Not the only fruit. Next, you tell me. Next book I have is Into the Wild by John Krakow. 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 Um, this is the story of Chris McCandless who uh, died in 1992. Um, he was basically like went off in on his own into the Alaskan wilderness and trying to survive without any modern conveniences. Um, so this talks about Chris's uh, youth and all his adventures up until this this fateful day, and also goes into a few other stories of um, adventurous people like taking on like what why do we why do we try to face nature like what's the impetus for that. Bit of a depressing read to be honest. <laughs> uh, I was hoping for more like wild into the wild and it'd be more about kind of like a soul searching thing but this felt more like a desperate grappling with the point of life as opposed to like an inspirational like let nature control me it's more like you are at the mercy of nature. Um, but you know interesting to read about. I'm gonna stop making up a tea because my throat is clearly not handling all of these book reviews well. So many books. Hello, back from the tea break. Um, 
Now, I've also made a little stand so you can see all of the books we have left. Yay. Right, not too many. Let's go. Uh, Winter by Ali Smith, the second in her season's quartet. Um, I really, really enjoyed Autumn when I read it. This I enjoyed slightly less. Um, it's the same, the same sort of thing. It's just like people interacting with each other and then some like strange esoteric artistic intellectualism thing that goes back in time. Um, still felt, did feel very nice and wintry. Uh, but yeah, I care slightly less. It's still just like phenomenal writing though. I really like her writing style. So I, I'm looking forward to the rest of these coming out. Yay. Children of Men by P.D. James. Uh, this is actually given to me by um, a guy that works in favour. So thank you. Um, so Children of Men, I, what, I remember watching the film years ago and really loving it. Um, but I barely remember what happened in it. And I know so many people are like, oh, it's so different to the book, isn't it? Or like the book's so different to the movie. I'm like, just, I don't know. Um, so this is a world where no child has been born for 25 years. So they just aren't, like at a certain point in time, children stop being born. Um, and then you may be able to tell by the cover, uh, a woman gets pregnant. So this is basically about the, the man that tries to protect her. I mean, there's a whole group of people, but um, it's about this, this one man who's uh, cousin to the, the, the guy that basically runs the country. It's sort of a dictatorship. Yeah, it also, it kind of felt like what I was saying about um, Trouble with Lycan, where the, the story should have started at the end of it, you know? Like it was, it was very slow for a lot of it and then it just things started heating up and then it was over. But you know, it was, it was enjoyable. I'm stressed about talking too quickly because of low battery, even though it was fully charged at the start of this. So I'm just gonna, we'll be back, we'll be back soon. And we are back. Okay, the next book I have to talk about is Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. This was really big on booktube. Uh, it came out last year, damn it, damn it. Fact check, girl, fact check. It did in fact come out last year. Uh, and it follows two families in this like, idyllic constructed neighborhood in near Chicago? It's not near Chicago. Is this somewhere near Detroit? Near Chicago, let's go with that. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's a, it was a really just like fun palette cleanser um, with really nice intertwined stories and you know, young people growing up and I, I just, I've lost all my words. I really, I really like this a lot. I, I have her other book, Everything I Never Told You, built that for Christmas. So I will also be reading that soon. Strong recommend if you want something that's just like fun and that you're gonna guarantee to like without having to like, without having to care or think that much. This is the book for you. The next book I have is Purple Hibiscus by Jermanda Ngozi Adichie. Uh, I bought this in an airport and I, I've, I've owned Americana for like three years and still haven't read it. Uh, but when I saw this, I was like, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. Um, so this is about a family living in Nigeria, uh, mostly about this 16-year-old uh, girl called Kambili. Her father is the leader of their community and is a very religiously intolerant, um, pious and abusive man. And it made me angry. It made me really angry. It's one of those one of those like classic books where it's like they're obviously very abusive but then do also care and have redeeming factors but they're really abusive so that doesn't matter. Um, this was a cool insight into life in Nigeria. Um, so this was written, I want to say 2006. Stop guessing, stop guessing. 2004. Uh, so there wasn't like mobile phones or things back then. There were mobile phones but as in you weren't kind of affected by modern technology and I do love that in a book. Um, uh, but I don't know anything about Nigeria. I've never been to mo like the middle chunk of Africa. Um, so, and also all their food, so many great descriptions of food in here. I made Nigerian food like three times a week I made this and it was all delicious. <laughs> so um, get it for the recipes. But no, the things about this that were interesting were seeing the kind of range of lived experiences. You know, this leader of the community and then leader of their sort of village, um, they have they have these mansions and banquets, but then also their like granddad would be living in squalor and they, and because they're like 
they're staying at university and their rights at university and just having that uncertainty the whole time about your, your permanence of the permanence of your affluence is quite um, strange and interesting. I, I liked it a lot. I would I would like to read Americana and everything else that Chimamanda has written. Good book! <laughs> Next book I have was the start of my memoir season and this is In Order to Live by Yomi Park. Um, this is this girl's escape from, from North Korea. So she grew up with her, her sister in North Korea. Um, I didn't really, I mean obviously I knew things about North Korea. I watched a couple of documentaries and stuff. Uh, but just I didn't understand how it was actually very prosperous until the 90s when they had a lot of like famine and agricultural breakdown um, and that created just this huge divide where the vast majority of people were in poverty um, and yeah so this is like her life in North Korea and you know her family her dad at like smuggles and his main business is smuggling as lots of people's were because that was the only way to get like the necessities of life um but then she and her mother escape through china um and get human trafficked and then she you know she has a pimp and it's like all just just awful they finally escape china um by by walking through the gobi desert at night until they could get to mongolia which point they would be extradited to South Korea and South Korea has a rehabilitation program for um, North Korean defectors and then she has to like assimilate to life in South Korea and until she hasn't had any you know formal education at all so when she got to South Korea she had to yeah just just oh wow just like an incredible terrific strong story of like human resilience and her taking on just so much responsibility it felt like for a lot of the book, she was um, she, she was carrying the family more than her mother could at the time, and that's so much to put on on a, a young woman. Uh, she was most brought to prominence by this talk she gave at UN the UN something in the UN in Ireland a few years ago. I didn't realize until after I'd read it that I'd actually seen that talk because um, she that's the point where she first starts talking about how she was. She was trafficked. That's something that happened to a lot of North Korean defectors, uh, but is often hidden because of all of the shame attached to it. Um, yeah, really just an incredible story, um, but I can't help but comment for this and also another book I'm gonna mention later. The reason this is remarkable is because she managed to escape and no, like, you just think of the countless, countless people that are still stuck in Korea, North Korea, or, you know, didn't get out of this like, human trafficking nightmare or got like so many people there was just this one bit that so they were in groups um it was missionaries that were helping them escape through through the Gobi Desert and they would do it in batches and her and her mother uh, ended up going moving kind of forward a, a, a batch um and they said that the people the batch before them and the batch after them all got caught and sent back to North Korea and were almost definitely all executed. And she says it so so casually because it's such a, a reality of their situation, you know? That's so expected. Um, it doesn't get treated as an atrocity because it's what happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strong recommendation. Next book I have is totally different. Um, this is Better Than Before. Uh, by Gretchen Rubin. I started listening to Gretchen Rubin's podcast with her sister Happier uh, earlier in the year. It's all about, well, not about happiness in the Darren Brown sense, but more in kind of making your life as, as productive and healthy as it can be. Um, and this is a book about habit formation. I would sort of solved my habit formation problems by the time I got to this book. I feel like I'd re like listened to enough about it and through the whole running thing had kind of got into a very healthy space about it um but this was good to sort of like solidify a lot of those ideas about you know doing it in small chunks um uh but i i really didn't like how self-aggrandizing she was <laughs> like she come she came up with this um thing called the four tendencies framework which i'm kind of annoyed that it works because i don't want it to because i don't want her to be right because she's really annoying about it so she literally says, I want, I want to find this for you because it's ridiculous. As I developed the framework of the four tendencies, 
I truly felt as though I were discovering the periodic table of elements, the elements of character. I wasn't making up a system, I was uncovering a law of nature. Or perhaps I created a habit sorting app. Like, you were not uncovering a law of nature. Anyway, it is a, it is a nice, I think all sort of personality type dividers are useful but shouldn't be taken as the be all and end all, you know? Like, anyone can divide anyone into any number of categories. But this divides people into four categories based on how they respond to inner and outer expectation. So there is the upholder that will respond to inner and outer expectation, uh, the obliger that will respond to outer expectation or inner expectation, the questioner that will respond to inner and outer, and the rebel that just won't respond to either. Um, there's like a quiz online that you can do to find, I think it's like the four tendencies quiz.com or something like that. So once you find that out, it's more about creating like your habit structures to fit those, those tendencies. So if you are an obliger, um, setting inner expectations won't help you, but having something like an accountability partner, having someone else be responsible for what you're doing. And me, and like, if you're the opposite, if you're a questioner, it needs to like really make sense to you. You need to be able to justify it. Having someone else to tell you to do it won't matter. I have to, have to accept that I am a rebel. I keep thinking of myself as a questioner, but I'm not, I'm a rebel. I find it really hard to do anything. I find it so hard to do anything. And I, and I finally, it, rebels need to feel like they're in control at all times. So I can't just like go on a run every morning. Every morning I have to like decide that I want to go on a run, which is a, it just feels like such a hard place to start from. Like rebels have such a hard time. Um, but I found like one thing that's been really, really working for me for this past couple weeks. I wonder if I can, couple weeks, couple months, it's been a while. Uh, can I show you? I use this habit tracking app called Loop for Android. I made an, an extra dashboard on my phone that shows how I'm doing with each of them and gives me an easy way to ch check them off. Um, so I have things like exercise and it will show me how I'm doing over time and then I can, I can you know, it just really keeps me accountable in a way that nothing else would. <laughs> I know friends that have great success with things like don't break the chain but that feels really damaging to me because I don't want to have a streak based system because I feel like if I break it once I'd be throwing away the whole system but this is because keep is based on sort of like percentages of how well you're doing a loss doesn't feel like that much of a loss it always feels like a positive thing i'm not overly into quantified self things anymore i used to have a fitness tracker thing and then i uh, grew up um but this is just extremely satisfying for now it's really working for me anyway so that's better than before the next book i have again another like really random one um is guards guards by cherry pratchett I think this is the fourth, it's either the fourth or the eighth, maybe it's the sixth um, of Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. I know this is something that people, you've either spent your whole youth reading these and know everything back to back, or you just haven't, um, and I'm one of the latter. My boyfriend was really into Terry Pratchett and wanted me to discover it as well, and he was like, you should, he gave me sort of like a list of ones that would be nice places to start or nice standalone things, um, and this is the one I picked. So. It's very silly. I honestly, I wasn't in the right mood for it when I started reading it. I shouldn't have read it at this point in time. Um, Cause it's just like completely absurd. It's very absurd, um, but quite like fun. All of the, so it takes place in this fictional disc world, which is like a disc on the back of four turtles on the back of an elephant or something like that. Uh, whatever. Um, and uh, this one particularly is about the, the city guards of Ankh-Morpork, which is the capital city of the biggest city in, uh, in Discworld. Um, and these guards are all like super bumbling and uh, idiots and drunks and can't do anything. And it kind of annoyed me how there were weren't very few like competent characters. <laughs> but um, yeah, basically some evil guy summons a dragon and then there'd, you know, things happen. It's really fun though. I think it'd be a really enjoyable thing to, I just had to be in the right mood for it. I would love to kind of read this with my kids as they grow up. I keep thinking about having kids and reading to them, guys. I'm not, not there yet, but it's just, like, I feel like I could just enjoy all of these things with no guilt if I'm doing it with a child. But if I spent the next year just reading Terry Pratchett, I would really judge myself. The next book is the only other besides Wild Five Star that I gave on Goodreads um, this half year, uh, which is When Beth Breath Becomes Air, by Paul Kalanithi. This was phenomenal. So it is about a neurosurgeon 
Um, it is non-fiction, it's a memoir, um, and he is just coming to the end of his, his training and he is diagnosed with, with inoperable lung cancer, um, age 36. So that's a lot. So this is written in the last like two years of his life um, and just meditating on a lot of things really. Like life as a neurosurgeon is so intense um, and I loved reading from that that kind of perspective and that world is, is really interesting to me. But then he was also struggling with go, becoming the patient, coming going from the expert to, to being the patient, seeing things from that side and thinking a lot about you know family and expectation and you know he has a child during these these last couple of years and um, I'm really thinking about the purpose of life like he's always been I, obviously like an extremely gifted man um, who ended up doing neurosurgery but may equally have gone into philosophy and literature um, and you can tell from from reading this that he is very very well read um, and has thought a lot about the things he's contemplating in, in the novel. Lots of meditations on the purpose of life and it's just, it was, it was really well written and, and elegant and, um, and quite something and it made me cry a lot. It made me cry the most out of any of these books. It's a big cry book. If you want to cry, but it's not from like a shitty romance, the book for you. <laughs> and this is the last book. I feel like I must have missed, I've definitely missed some audiobook I was supposed to talk about. Hold on. Oh, I did. I missed, so I listened to Michelle Obama's new memoir, Becoming, um, and it was very good. Oddly, I don't know, I don't know what, but I must have read a really long New York Times article about Obama or something. Like, I can't, I can't think of what it was, but I just knew a lot of this story very well, as in a lot of their Chicago days very well. Um, and yeah, really cool to hear Michelle talk about being, you know, being a, ambitious black girl essentially and having being in a less rich house and having seeing her as a because a lot of it a lot of the book is is her as a as a child um and just seeing her kind of like setting her expectations around you know what she sees and being put into these categories and stuff was was really fascinating and then obviously you see her rising up and then suddenly she has a law degree and is like a very successful woman and then she meets up with this obviously successful guy and you see how their lives really really ramp up um towards you know becoming the first lady um yeah great it was her yeah it was the thing is i've read so many sensational memoirs this year and the last one is also that that although michelle obama has obviously had a really interesting life it's just not as dramatic as escaping from north korea um, but it was very good, would recommend. So here we have the last, the last book. We're almost at the end, guys. Um, this is Educated by Tara Westover. This was a pick for my tiny three-person book club who, where we meet up every like year and a half to talk about a book. But we had a very interesting talk about this the other day. Um, so Tara Westover is the seventh, the youngest of seven um, in her family from Idaho. And her dad was a very extreme, um, extremely Mormon figure who was just really intolerant of basically anything um, and they they have a very insular family and only became more insular over time her and her three next siblings that weren't you know didn't have birth certificates weren't ever in in primary education secondary education um, and this is about Tara deciding that she wanted to pursue uh, like some formal education um, and I thought I thought that would be the story is her like just getting out of her home um, and you know making it to university somehow but it was really a lot more about this kind of like entangled relationship she has with her family and um, their expectations for her and her wanting to remain connected to them while discovering and accepting a lot of their um, their downsides and how they'd they'd kept things from her and um, and also how she, you know some she she goes and learns a lot of you know she ends up with a phd the very educated woman but she somehow manages to get in, into university without knowing what the holocaust was and just not having any of that kind of like social context she loved her family so much and been really really indoctrinated into their way of thinking 
um, that in learning about a lot of the ways that she wasn't that she, that she was held back as a child essentially um, or put in danger were was difficult for her to assimilate with with her love for her family um, not only did the family not really believe in education the dad was all on about like Illuminati the government are trying to get you with taxes and stuff um, they didn't believe in the medical establishment which meant that a lot of accidents happened and they didn't get taken to hospital as they should have and they would be like the lord will fix us with these herbs that her mum makes and it's just like a very shocking way of living to to me i mean i know that those kind of communities exist um but with this book you get to you get to really get into that world and then also see it very literally compared with with the world that she she learns of later um really excellent excellent book to round off the year with so yeah, guys we did it we talked about 33 books i promise it's not going to happen to again it won't happen again I've, i'm committing to doing a i know i said that i hate roundups wrap-ups but i people change i've changed i'm going to do a monthly wrap-up i think of every uh, each you know you'll get 12 videos next year as always all of the books i've mentioned will be down below with their star ratings and their book depository and amazon and goodreads links and I will see you hopefully at the at the end of January. Thank you for getting through this with me. Can you comment if you've actually met if you watched this whole video? Because I would be shocked.